We present I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, the first volume of Maya Angelou's extraordinary memoirs. In 1931, when I was three and my brother Bailey four, we arrived wearing tags on our wrists. To whom it may concern, Marguerite, Marguerite and, and Bailey Johnson, Johnson Jr. Jr. from Long, Long Beach, California, California en route to Stamps, to Stamps Arkansas, Arkansas, care of Mrs. Annie Henderson. Years later, I discovered thousands of frightened black children made the journey alone, north to south, back to grandparents. Our parents had decided to put an end to their calamitous marriage, and father shipped us home to his mother. <sighs> another day, another morning, Lord. <clears throat> Our oh, Father, thank you for letting me see this new day. Thank you that you didn't allow the bed I lay on last night to be my cooling board, nor my blanket, my wine. We lived with Mama. We had soon stopped calling her grandmother and Uncle Willie in the rear of the store. The store! The store! The store! It was always spoken of with a capital S, which Mama had owned for some 25 years. Customers could find mash for hogs, corn for chickens, coal oil for lamps, light bulbs for the wealthy, shoestrings, hairdressing, balloons, and flower seeds. Anything not visible had only to be ordered. Lift this house and everybody in it. Thank you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Marguerite, Bailey, time to wake up. Charles need doing. Each day... After our early chores were done and before school, we were free to play. Last night, night before, hours, Bailey was the greatest person in my world, and the fact that he was my brother, and I had no sisters to share him with, was such good fortune that it made me want to live a Christian life to show God I was grateful. Where I was big, elbowing and grating, he was small, graceful and smooth. His hair fell down in black curls, and my head was covered with black steel wool. And yet, he loved me. You let that man hit him in the head with a rolling pin. Who all is hit? Who all is hit? Of all the needs a lonely child has, the one that must be satisfied is the unshaking need for an unshakable God. My pretty black brother was my kingdom come <laughs> during the picking season my grandmother would get out of bed at 4 a.m. to light the coal tar lamp the wagons would arrive soon after to load on the cotton pickers who had walked miles the store being the pickup place that would then take them to the remains of slavery plantations in these tender mornings the store was full of workers laughing, joking, boasting, and bragging, with their empty cotton sacks dragging behind them. I'm going to get 200 pounds of cotton today. I was looking 300. Sister, I have two cans of sardines. I'm going to work so fast, I'm going to make you look like you can steal. In the dying sunlight, the people dragged rather than their empty cotton sacks. The pickers would step back out of the trucks, Dirt disappointed. No matter how much they picked, it wasn't enough. Oh, even my bones is worried today, sister. Oh, I say I pick more than I scale, say. Seven one seven. Seven two's party. Seven three's twenty-one. When Bailey was six, and I a year younger. Start again, Bailey. Seven one seven. Uncle Willie, he had been crippled as a child. His face pulled down on the left side, and his left hand was only a mite bigger than Bailey's. But on the second mistake or the third hesitation, his big overgrown right hand would catch us by the collar and thrust us towards the dull red stove. We were never burned, but it was close. Annie? Annie, tell Willie he better lay low. Something wrong, Mr. Stewart? The used-to-be sheriff sat rakishly astraddle his horse. Tell Willie he better lay low tonight. 
crazy nigger messed with a white lady today. Some of the boys be coming over here later. Willie, hmm? Ma, Bailey, you heard? We got things to do. Blow them lamps out right now, Willie. Marguerite, you and Bailey empty those potatoes and onions out their bins. Yes, Mama. Yes, Mama. Oh. Lord. <laughs> you gonna hide me, man? He got no choice. Hurry up now. With a tedious and fearful slowness, Uncle Willie gave me his rubber-tipped cane and bent down to get into the now enlarged empty bin. Lay down flat, Willie. Now cover him as quick as you can. In the darkness, we covered him with potatoes and onions, layer upon layer, like a casserole. Lord. I was asking you in your infinite mercy to spare my son's life. He done suffered enough already. He moaned through the whole night, as if, in fact, he had been guilty of some heinous crime. It was fortunate that the boys didn't ride over to the store that evening. They would surely have found Uncle Willie, and just as surely lynched him. Face his arms, necks, legs, and feet. Wash as far as possible, and then wash possible. Yes, yes Mama. Mama. Hmm. Thou shalt not be dirty, and thou shalt not be impudent, were the two commandments upon which hung our total salvation. The impudent child was detested by God and a shame to its parents. All adults had to be addressed as Mr., Mrs., Miss, Auntie, Cousin, uncle, sister, brother. Everyone I knew respected these customary laws, except for poor white trash children. Hey, Willie. <laughs> Some families of poor white trash lived on Mama's farmland. Sometimes a gaggle of them came to the store, crawled all over the shelves, twanging all the time in their sharp voices like cigar box guitars. I say, Willie. Calling call my, my uncle by his first, first name. name. Go on. Do as I say and go over there and get me some peanuts. <laughs> yes, 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 yes Miss Helen. And to my shame, he followed their orders. Here's sugar, Miss Porter. And uh, here's baking powder. You didn't buy soda last month. You probably been be needing some. Mama always directed her statements to the adults. But sometimes, oh, painful sometimes... <laughs> The grind, snotty-nosed girls would answer her. No, Annie, just give us some extra soda crackers and some more mackerel. <laughs> no, Annie? To Mama? Mama? One summer afternoon, I had just swept the yard of spearmint gum wrappers and Vienna sausage labels. I raked the yellow-red dirt into half-moons so that the design stood out clearly. Mama didn't say anything, but I knew she liked it. She was on the front porch in her big white apron, an apron so stiff with starch it could have stood alone. About the same time, a troop of poor white trash kids marched over the hill. Mama, don't wait for them. Sister, go on inside. Don't wait for them. Come on inside. If they come in the store, you let me wait on them. Inside, Marguerite. I went to stand behind the screen door. One of them lifted her chest, folded her arms, and mocked Mama's strange carriage. Your back's too straight, and mouth ain't pooched out enough. It, it's like this. <laughs> Pooch out your mouth more like this. Come on. Through the fly-specked screen door, I could see that the arms of Mama's apron jiggled with a vibration of her humming. The tears that had slipped down my dress left unsurprising dark spots. A girl crossed her eyes and put thumbs in her mouth. Look here, Annie. Look here. I wanted to throw a handful of black pepper in their faces to scream that they were dirty, scummy peckerwoods. They all moved back from the porch. I thought they were going to throw a rock at Mama, but then... Take a good look, Annie. She turned her back, bent down, and put her hands flat on the ground. Her dirty bare feet went straight for the sky. Her dress fell down around her shoulders. She had on no drawers. 
The slick hair made a brown triangle where her legs came together. A little while longer, everything will be all right. Just a little God, how long Mama really gonna hold out? What they gonna do next? What would Mama really like me to do? Tell me, Lord. Then they were moving out of the yard. <laughs> Bye, Miss Hannah. Bye, Miss Ruth. No, Mama. Bye, Miss Eloise. Nasty. How could Mama call them Miss? The mean, nasty things. What did she prove? Mama opened the screen door to look down on me, crying in rage. Her face was a brown moon that shone on me. She was beautiful. Go wash your face, sister. Yeah. Yes, Mama. Everything. Whatever the contest had been out front of the store, Mama had won. Everything's gonna be. I took my rake to the front yard. The smudged footprints were easy to erase. Come look, Mama. <clears throat> Sister, that's right, pretty. One Christmas, we received gifts from our mother and father, who lived separately in a heaven called California. I couldn't believe that our mother would laugh and eat oranges in the sunshine without her children. Until that Christmas, I was confident they were both dead. I could cry any time I wanted by picturing my mother. I didn't quite know what she looked like, so her features weren't filled in, lying in her coffin, with her head on a tiny little white pillow, and a sheet over her. Tears would fall down my cheeks like warm milk. Then, this terrible Christmas came. Will they give you Marguerite? Daddy sent his photograph. And mother sent these. Mmm. Tea set and a doll. Where you going, sister? Maya, Maya, wait. Bailey, Marguerite, you come back here. I went out to the backyard behind the china berry tree. <laughs> the day was cold, and the air as clear as water. Why did they send us away, Bailey? What did we do so wrong? I don't know. I just don't know. <laughs> Bailey and I tore the stuffing out of the doll, but he warned me that I had to keep the tea set in good condition. Why should I? Maybe Mother's getting ready to come and get us. Maybe she just been angry at something we done. But she forgiven us now. Maybe any day or not, she might just come right enough. Do you really think so, Bailey? Maybe. Grandmother, or Mama as we called her, cut down a few giveaways that had been traded to her by white women's maids, and sat long nights in the back of the store, sewing jumpers and skirts for me. Try this on. See if it fits. You be a good girl now. You hear? Don't you make people think I didn't raise you right. I was thinking, should I beg her to let me stay? I'd take over Bailey's chores and do my own as well, but instead I said, "Yes, Mama." We were leaving Stamps to start a new life. Our daddy had turned up out of the blue to take us away. Bailey and I thought we were going to live with him, but instead, he took us straight to our mother, Marguerite, Bailey. <laughs> And there she was. It is remarkable how much truth there is in the two expressions, struck dumb, and love at first sight. Ma, look at her. 
She's beautiful. Read those boxes inside. What are you staring at, babies? Come inside. My mother's beauty literally assailed me. Bailey, on his part, fell instantly and forever in love. I had never seen a woman as pretty as she was who was called... Mother. She's too beautiful to have children. Who would like some lemonade? Vivian, where you put my... Oh, they've arrived. Mother's boyfriend, Mr. Freeman, lived with us. He was a big man, and he was lucky to get her. And he knew it. No! No! Marguerite! Marguerite! Bailey and I were afflicted. He tripped over his words, and I sweated through horrifying nightmares. Wake up, child! Mother! It's fine. It's all right. You'll be fine. It's just a dream. Come. You're coming in with me. After the third time in Mother and Mr. Freeman's large bed, I thought there was nothing strange about sleeping there. One morning, a mother got out of bed for an early errand, and I fell asleep again. Don't move, Reedy. Mr. Freeman pulled me to him. He threw back the blankets, dragged me on top of his chest with his left arm. His right hand was moving so fast and his heart was beating so hard, I was afraid that he would die. Finally, he was quiet. And then came the nice part. He held me so softly that I wished he wouldn't ever let me go. Maybe he was my real father, and we'd found each other at last. Then... I gotta talk to you, Reedy. <laughs> Get up. You peed in the bed. But... Reedy, you love Bailey. Yes. If you ever tell anybody what we did... I'll have to kill Bailey. What had we done? We. It had something to do with him holding me. The thought that he might kill Bailey stunned me. For months, he stopped speaking to me. I started to read more than ever and wished to my soul that I had been born a boy. I took out my first library card and spent most of my Saturdays at the library breathing in the world of penniless shoeshine boys who became rich men and gave baskets of goodies to the poor on holidays. Then, when spring came... Reedy? Reedy, come here. He grabbed my arm. Mm. I was sure that any minute Mother or Bailey or the Green Hornet would burst into the room and save me. If you scream, I'm gonna kill you. If you tell... I woke up in a white-walled world, but Mr. Freeman was there, and he was watching. I didn't mean to hurt you, Reedy. Look, I didn't mean it, but don't you tell. Remember, don't you tell soul. No, sir. I won't tell. It's just that I'm so tired. I'll go lay down for a little while, please. Your mama ought to be coming home soon. You just act natural. Go get dressed. Go to the library. Walking down the street. My hips seemed to be coming out of their socket. After two blocks, I knew I'd never make it. I turned back home. I wouldn't make it unless I counted every step. 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 And stepped step. on every crack. Step on the crack. <laughs> One step at a time. No one was in the living room. So I went straight to bed after hiding my stained pants 
under the mattress. Well, young lady, I believe this is the first time I've seen you go to bed without being told. You must be sick. The pit of my stomach was on fire. What's the matter, Ma? There was nothing to tell him. You have a little fever. You probably caught the measles. They say they're going around the neighborhood. Then Bailey ought not to be in there with her. Unless you want a house full of sick children. Well, he may as well have them now as later. Get them over with. Come on, Bailey Jr. Let's get some cold towels. Wipe your sister's face. Yes, Mother. If you tell. I won't. That night, I kept waking to hear Mother and Mr. Freeman arguing. I hoped she wouldn't make him so mad that he'd hurt her, too. Maybe I slept. But soon, morning was there. And Mother was pretty over my bed. How are you feeling, baby? F fine, Mother. Where where's Bailey? Still asleep. And Mr. Freeman? He's gone. Moved this morning. Could I tell her now? The terrible pain assured me I couldn't. If Mr. Freeman was gone, did that mean that Bailey was safe? That Sunday still comes and goes in my memory, like a bad connection on an overseas phone call. It's okay. We'll take care of you. She needs to be bathed. Fresh sheets, Bailey. She's sweated clean through these. No, no. Oh, hold her, Bailey. Can't you won't let me. Oh, oh, hush, baby. Mama's here. Hush. Easy now. Come on, let Mama pick you up, baby. As Bailey pulled off the soiled sheets, he dislodged the pants I had put under the mattress. Later, in hospital. Ma, you have to tell me who did this to you. You might hurt another little girl. I can't. I can't. He'll kill you, he said so. He can't kill me. I won't let him. And of course, I believed him. Bailey didn't lie to me. So I told him. Bailey cried at the side of my hospital bed until I started to cry too. Using the old brain he was born with, he gave his information to my mother, and she told her mother, Grandmother Baxter, and Mr. Freeman was arrested. I would have liked to stay in hospital for the rest of my life. Grandmother Baxter was a precinct captain in the police force, and that gave her great power. Her sons, my mother's brothers, Uncles Tootie, Tom, and Ira, were well-known young men around St. Louis. They all had city jobs, no mean feat for Negro men, but were best known for their unrelenting meanness. They beat up whites and blacks with the same abandon. My uncles were like wild horses in the hospital room, and... What was the defendant wearing? Uh, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I sat with my raging uncles and my family in court... And they rested still on the seats like solid, cold, gray tombstones. You mean to say, this man raped you, and you don't know what he was wearing? Do you know if you were raped? Mr. Freeman twisted in his chair to look empty threats over to me. Was that the first time the accused touched you? Did the accused try to touch you before the time he, or rather, you say, he raped you? I couldn't say yes. Grandmother Baxter and the people in court would stone me as they had stoned the harlot in the Bible. No, no! Oh, me dirty thing, you! Dirty old thing! Mr. Freeman was given one year and one day, but he didn't serve his sentence. His lawyer got him released that afternoon. Double six, have another turn. And you pass go. Here's your two hundred. I'll get it. Don't you move my marker off Fifth Avenue, but I intend to buy it. A tall white policeman asked for Mrs. Baxter. 
I had sworn on the Bible that everything I said would be the truth. The policeman was taller than the sky and whiter than my image of God. I thought you ought to know. Freeman's been found dead. Some say he was kicked to death. Poor man, my grandmother said. But maybe it's better this way. And then the recording dreadful angel and the guise of the policeman counting out my sins left. A man was dead, and I had forfeited my right to heaven. I had sold myself to the devil, and there could be no escape. I could feel the evilness pent up, waiting to rush off my tongue. I clamped my teeth shut. I'd hold it in. If it escaped, wouldn't it flood the world and all the innocent people? I had to stop talking. Stop talking to everyone but Bailey. I loved him so much I knew I'd never hurt him. But if I talked to anyone else, that person might die too. In the first weeks, my family accepted my behavior as a post-rape affliction. Even after the last visit from the visiting nurse, I still refused to be the child they knew. Months and then years went by. Marguerite, come on. Say it to us. Speak to us. Come on. Say it to us. Speak to us. Me. Eventually, I was called impudent, and my muteness, sullenness. Mother, mother. We'll be okay, Bailey. I promise. No, no, we won't. Mother. We were on the train back to Stamps. I have never known if our grandmother sent for us or if Mother just got fed up with my grim presence. But I didn't really care. I only cared for poor Bailey. had been back in Stamps, Arkansas for several years where my enforced silence was part of everyday life. So it continued on and on until I was to meet the lady who threw me my first lifeline. Good day, Mrs. Henderson. How do, Sister Flowers? Mrs. Bertha Flowers was the aristocrat of black stamps. She wore beautiful flowered hats and her skin was a rich black that would have peeled like a plum if snagged. She appealed to me because she was like the women in English novels who strode the moors and read Morocco-bound books. Sister Flowers, I sent Bailey up to your house for these groceries. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Henderson. I prefer Marguerite, though. She makes my name sound so beautiful. I've been meaning to talk to her anyway. Well, that's all right, then. Sister, go and change your dress. You're going to Sister Flowers. What on earth did one put on to go to Mrs. Flowers' house? A Sunday dress might be sacrilegious. I was already wearing a house dress. I know. A school dress. Naturally. Formal, but not too church-like. Now, don't you look nice, Marguerite? Mrs. Henderson, you make most of your children's clothing, don't you? Yes, ma'am. Sure do. Store-bought clothes ain't hardly worth the thread it takes to stitch them. I'll say you do a lovely job. So neat. That dress looks professional. I try with the help of the Lord, sister, to finish the inside just like I does the outside. <laughs> Come here, Marguerite. Take it off, sister. No, 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 no. Taking off my dress? In front of Miss Flowers? It's going to kill me stone dead. I, I don't need to see the inside, Mrs. Henderson. You see here, Sister Flowers, our French seams around armholes. That is a very good job, Mrs. Henderson. You should be proud. Uh, you can put your dress back on, Marguerite. I put my dress back on, and I picked up the groceries and went to wait in the hot sunshine. It would be fitting if I just dropped dead on the slanting porch. There was a little path beside the rocky road leading to Miss Flower's house. 
I hear you're doing very good schoolwork, Marguerite, but the teachers report they have trouble getting you to talk in class. The path widened to allow us to walk together, but I hung back. Come walk with me, Marguerite. Now, no one is going to make you talk, but bear in mind that language is a man's way of communicating with his fellow man. It is language alone that separates us from the lower animals. Your grandmother says you read a lot. That's good, but not good enough. Words mean more than what is set down on paper. It takes human voice to infuse them with the shades of deeper meaning. The voice infuses deeper meaning. That's nice. I'm going to lend you some books. You must read them and try to make a sentence sound in as many different ways as possible. Ah, here we are. The sweet scent of vanilla met us as we opened the door. I made tea cookies this morning. I had planned to invite you for cookies and lemonade so we could have this little chat. Uh, have a seat, Marguerite, over there by the table. I never connected food and anything as common as eating with Miss Flowers, but... Now, I haven't baked in a long time, but I've made these cookies especially for you. Just for me. As I ate, taking nice little ladylike bites off the edges... She began the first of my lessons in living. Be intolerant of ignorance, Marguerite, but understanding of illiteracy. Listen to the mother wit of country people. In their sayings is couched the collective wisdom of generations. On another visit, she brought a thick, small book from the bookcase. I had read A Tale of Two Cities. She opened the first page... And I heard poetry <clears throat> for the first time. It was the best of times and the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. Were they the, the same lines I had read? We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going the other way. How do you like that? Marguerite? It occurred to me that Miss Flowers expected a response. I could taste the vanilla on my tongue. Her reading was a wonder in my ears. I had to. Marguerite? Yeah. Marguerite? Y yes, yes, ma'am. Well done, Marguerite. Now take this book of poems and memorize one for me. Next time you pay me a visit, I want you to recite it. I ran down the hill into the road and had the good sense to stop running before I reached the store. I was liked. And what a difference it made. Not as Mrs. Henderson's grandchild or Bailey's sister, but just for being Marguerite Johnson. To be allowed, no, to be invited into her home and to read and read the whole school library with Miss Flowers. James Langston Hughes, Edgar Allan Poe, Balzac, Shakespeare. I memorized all the sonnets. It was a chance to exchange the southern bit of wormwood for a cup of mead with Beowulf or a hot cup of tea and milk with Oliver Twist. And when I said aloud, It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. Tears of love filled my eyes. It never occurred to me that Mama might have asked her to give me a little talking to. I didn't question why Miss Flowers had singled me out. She had, and that was good enough for me. More than this, Miss Flowers had given me a secret word which called forth a gin who was to serve me all my life. Books. It was twilight, and Bailey was late. Very late, coming back from the Rialto picture house. The black woman in the South who raises sons, grandsons, and nephews has her heartstrings tied to a hanging noose. Any break from routine may herald unbearable news. Mama was scrubbing the kitchen table for the umpteenth time when she said, Maybe we should walk down and meet him. Let's go, Mama. Wait a minute, little lady. Go and get your sweater and bring me my shawl. Yes, Mama.
It was darker in the road than I thought it would be. The night suddenly became enemy territory. And I knew that if my brother was lost in this land, he was forever lost. Here, sister. Take the lighter. Hold my hand. An old neighbor, his outline blacker than the night, passed us by, concerned we were out so late. Then I saw the small figure plodding along, tired and old mannish, like he was walking up a hill behind a coffin. Bailey! I tried to run to him and... No, sister! She yanked me back. we we'll walk just like we've been walking, young lady. There was no chance to warn Bailey. Bailey Jr., you know it's not, and you're just not getting home? Yes, ma'am. What you been doing? Nothing. That's all you got to say? Yes, ma'am. All right, young man. We'll see when we get home. Hey, Bailey. Leave me alone. When we got home, Uncle Willie volunteered to whip him. <coughs> Bailey! <laughs> now, don't you get uppity, miss, lest you want some of the same thing. He got a lesson coming to him. <coughs> For days, the store was a strange country. Bailey didn't talk, smile, or apologize. Then one evening at the pig pen... Maya, I saw Mother in the movies. It wasn't really her. It was a woman named Kay Francis. She's a white movie star who looks just like Mother. I stayed late to see the film over again. Next time another picture with Kay Francis comes to stamps, I'll take you. I'd like that. We had to wait nearly two months before Kay Francis returned to stamps. It was a comedy, and Kay Francis had a maid who was black and went around saying, Lousy, messy, all the time. I laughed, too. Not at the hateful jokes made on my people, I laughed because it was funny to think of the white folks not knowing that the woman they were adoring could be my mother's twin, except that she was white, and my mother was much prettier. You're all growing up. You need to be with your parents. Knowing Mama, I knew that I never knew Mama. Besides, your Uncle Willie's a cripple, and I'm gay, no. Whatever the real reason for taking us to California, I shall always think it lay mostly in an incident in which Bailey had the leading part. What's the matter, Bailey Jr.? A few weeks before Mama revealed her plans, he came into the store, shaking. Mama, what if color people don't know white folks? Color folks ain't even bother the hair on white folks' head. Some people say that white folks came over to Africa. She made it sound like a hidden valley in the moon. Africa. And stole the colored people and made them slaves. Ain't no way to explain what happened blows and scores ago, but right now they got the upper hand. Their time ain't long, though. Didn't the Lord protect the Hebrew children in the fiery furnace? We only has to wait on the Lord. I saw a man, a colored man. Nobody had protected him. He was dead. Dead and rotten. Junior, watch your tongue. Who? Who was it? When I passed the jail, some men had just fished him out of the pond. He was wrapped in a sheet, all rolled up like a mommy. Then a white man walked over and pulled the sheet off. Maya, he had no color at all. He was bloated like a ball. The white man stood there and grinned. There's one nigga nobody go to worry about no more. Mama, why do they hate us so much? They don't really hate us. They don't know us. They mostly scared. Bailey was away in a mystery. Locked in the enigma that young southern black boys start to unravel from seven years old to death. The humorless puzzle of inequality and hate. Don't know what this world is coming to. God rest his soul. Oh, man. I'm sure Mama began piecing together the details of our California trip that night. I didn't actually think about facing Mother until the last day of our journey. My old guilt came back to me like a much-missed friend. Would what Mr. Freeman had done to me be mentioned? The agony of wonder soured everything. But I needn't have worried. Marguerite? 
Really? Mm. Really? Mm. But you've got to be very quiet. What, what's wrong, Mother? Come with me. The clock on the dining room table said 2.30 a.m. You sit beside Bailey, Reedy. You've been invited to a party. I am giving a welcome party, and you two are my honored guests. She had baked a batch of her crispy brown cookies and had a pot of milk chocolate on the back of the stove. We were both enraptured and not unaware of Mother's nervousness. We had some power over the goddess, and we smiled conspiratorially. I apologize for not having an orchestra for us to dance to. Come on, Reedy, Bailey, let me show you how to do the Susie Q. Now you swing over here. Now you swing over there. Swing. Swing. What child can resist a mother who teaches you how to dance the time step and the snake hips after midnight and who laughs freely and often? Swing You're doing a Susie Q. It was 1943. Life had settled down, and the years had passed for Bailey and I with our mother Vivian in San Francisco. And now, age 15, I was getting a chance to get reacquainted with my father. Just like the movie stars Jane Withers and Donald O'Connor, I was going on vacation. My father, Daddy Bailey, he had invited me to spend the summer with him in Southern California, and I was jumpy with excitement. I expected him to live in a manor house, surrounded by grounds and liveried staff. Daddy Bailey had a girlfriend, Dolores, who was to meet me at the train station. Marguerite? The platform had emptied, and we had walked past each other time after time. Marguerite? Hello, Dolores. I guessed her to be in her early twenties, though she was the height of a child. She must have been horrified to find herself with a nearly six-foot prospective stepdaughter who was not even pretty. Instead of a manor house and servants, Daddy lived in a trailer park on the outskirts of a town that was itself the outskirts of a town. Dolores kept the house clean with the orderliness of a coffin, Artificial flowers reposed waxily in glass vases. She was on close terms with her washing machine, ironing board, and duster. And then... Oh, no! I came along. How many times do I have to tell you to be careful when you are dusting ornaments in your room, Marguerite? Oh, they're quite slippery. The dresser in my room was covered in little white porcelain figures. Was. Until I held one too tightly, or crunched off a leg, or dropped one... Again. Oh, dear! We indulged in a test of strength for weeks as Daddy stood figuratively on the sidelines. So, Marguerite, do you like your mother? Of course I do. She is beautiful and funny and very kind. <laughs> now, Vivian, Dolores, do you like Dolores? No. She's mean and petty and full of pretense. <laughs> she doesn't like me, either. She thinks I'm tall and arrogant and I'm not clean enough for her. <laughs> well, that's life. Daddy was an excellent cook, and he worked in the kitchen of a naval hospital, though both he and Dolores said he was a medical dietitian for the United States Navy. Mexican food was his speciality, and one evening he announced... Tomorrow... <clears throat> I'm going to Mexico to buy some food for the weekend. Okay. And I'll be taking Marguerite with me. What? I'm going to give her an opportunity to practice the Spanish she learned at school. Isn't that right, Reedy? Uh, yes. The dirt roads of Mexico fulfilled all my longing for the unusual. As we drove through border towns and headed for the interior, signs informed me that we were heading for Ensenada. We pulled up in the dirt yard of a cantina 
where half-clothed children chased mean-looking chickens around and around. A woman's voice sang out. Bye, Ali. Bye, Ali. Hey. <laughs> We were herded into a long room with a bar at the end. Bailey was obviously the hero of the hour, and as he warmed under the uninhibited shows of affection, I saw a new side to the man. He had never belonged in stamps. How maddening to have been born in a cotton field with aspirations of grandeur. Here he was sufficiently impressive. He was American. He was black. He spoke Spanish fluently. He had money and could drink tequila with the best of them. I was introduced as... La Nina de Bell. I ate chicharrones, crackling in a greasy newspaper, danced and drank the extra sweet and sticky Coca-Cola with the nearest approach to abandonment I had ever experienced. <laughs> It was only when the afternoon sun failed to light the room through the single window, I realized that I hadn't seen my father for some time. Donde esta mi padre? Nobody took my question seriously. Maybe it was my formal Spanish. A fog of panic began to suffocate me. He wasn't in the room. Had my drink been spiked? Dancers were blurring before my eyes. Daddy was gone. Had he sold me to the locals and was on his way back home with the money in his pocket? I had to get to the door. People stopped me with... Don Devas. Daddy? <laughs> Daddy! Daddy? Outside, Daddy's Hudson still sat in the yard in lonely splendor. He hadn't left me after all. I decided to sit in the car and wait for him, since he couldn't have gone far. I knew he was with a woman. I could lie down on the floor and make myself small and invisible. No chance. Oh, Lord, how could he just leave me? I tried to staunch the flood of fear. Why was I so afraid of the Mexicans? They had been really kind to me. Daddy wouldn't let anyone harm me. Wouldn't he? Would he? Did he even care what happened to me? No. Not a damn. Not a damn. I was going to die in a Mexican dirt yard. The special person with the intelligent mind that God and I had created was to depart alone without contribution or recognition. Really? What you doing in the car? Where were you? Just going for one last drink. Be right back. Wouldn't you like to get into the car? Rest a little. Good idea. No, not in the front. In the back seat. Just for a little while. He tried to arrange his long legs comfortably. And then... It sounded like the beginning of a deep and long sleep. And a warning that we were going to spend the night in a car in Mexico after all. I thought fast. I had never driven a car before, but I was superbly intelligent and had good physical coordination. Could I drive? Of course. Of course I can. Marguerite Johnson, you can do it. I set off down the mountainside to Calexico, oh. some 50 miles away. The challenge was exhilarating. It was me, Marguerite, against the elemental opposition. As I twisted the steering wheel and forced the accelerator to the floor, I was controlling Mexico, aloneness, inexperience, youth, Daddy Bailey, death, insecurity, and even gravity. After what seemed like a thousand and one nights of challenge, The mountain began to level off, and we finally reached the border and the guard's box. The guard stood erect, and as he saluted and barked, Passa, I panicked and lurched forward and crunched the car in front of me. Someone said Hoven, 
meaning I was young. Another, borracha, meaning drunk. Someone got the idea to look into the car, and then seeing Daddy spark out like a dead man. And they were saying, watch her. Don't let her out of your sight. Me padre! Me padre! Suddenly, they understood. I was not a drunken murderer, but a poor girl who was caring for her drunken father. Pobrecita. ¿Qué tiene? ¿Qué pasa? ¿Qué quiere? Dad, Dad. Dad, there's, there's been an accident. In the, in the glove compartment. The insurance papers. Get them and uh, give them to the police. The guard stuck his head in through the open window and asked Daddy to get out of the car. Never at a loss, Daddy reached into the glove compartment, took out the folded papers and the half bottle of liquor he had left there. Daddy shook hands with all the men, had a quiet word, offered them a drink. Then, miraculously, without even looking at the damaged cars, he eased himself behind the steering wheel and drove unerringly towards home. I didn't know you could drive, really. Do you like the car? Yes. Roll down that window, sister. The fresh air will do us both good. Get my jacket from the back seat. Put it on. Hello, kid. Hello, Dolores. Hello. She was making cute kitchen curtains and threaded her attention through the eye of her needle. Not knowing what to do, I said... Good night. And went to my room. Bailey. You've let your children come between us. Oh, kid, you're too sensitive. The children, uh, my children, can't come between us unless you let them. How can I stop it? They're doing it. You gave your daughter your jacket. What was I supposed to do? Let her freeze to death? Is that what you'd like? Kid, huh? You would, wouldn't you? Bailey, you know I wanted to like your kid. Why the hell don't you say what you mean? You're a pretentious little bitch, ain't you? That's what Marguerite called you, and she's right. Marguerite can go to hell, Bailey Johnson. I'm marrying you. I don't want to marry your children. No, more pity for you, you unlucky sow. I'm going out. Good night. In my room, I thought my father was mean and cruel. I felt sorry, and even a little guilty. I decided to go out and console her. I spoke in my best Florence Nightingale voice. Dolores... I don't mean to come between you and Dad. I wish you'd believe me. It is rude to eavesdrop on other people's conversations. A deaf person would have been hard put not to hear what you said. That's all. No, that's not all. Why don't you go back to your mother, if you got one? Oh, I've got one. And she's worlds better than you. Prettier, too. And intelligent. And she's a whore. I'm going to slap you for that, you silly old bitch. And before I could jump back, she had her arms around me. I felt something wet on my arm and looked down to find blood. I was cut. I saw a hammer in her hand, and without wondering if I would be able to take it from her, I fled. Daddy's car again offered magnificent refuge. <laughs> I sat in the car, feeling the blood slip down my back as he quieted and cooled her rage. Daddy looked angry as he came toward me. He felt the damp on his trousers as he sat in a corner of blood. What the hell was this, Marguerite? I've been cut. Cut? When? By whom? Daddy, even in a critical moment, wouldn't say by who. Dolores cut me. How badly? I don't know. I thought we were en route to an emergency hospital. And so, with serenity, I made plans for my death and will. My soul would escape gracefully. Bailey was to have my books, my records, and my love from the next world. And so, I groggily surrendered myself to oblivion.
Maya, that you? I want to come home, Mother. Send for me, please. I hadn't died. My father didn't take me to the hospital. He took me to a friend's house where my wound was bandaged. He gave me a dollar and a half and a kiss and promised to drop by later. By the time he returned, I'd run away. I'd spent an educational month in California, living in an abandoned car in a junkyard with a group of homeless kids, before I finally made that call to Mother. I'll send an air ticket to your daddy. It'll be easier if you send my fare straight to the airline. I can pick it up there. Oh, of course, Maya. Of course. See you soon, baby. I arrived in San Francisco, looking leaner than usual, fairly unkempt, and with no luggage. Maya, Maya, over here. Hello, Mother. Is the rationing that bad at your father's? Come on, you better have some food to stick to all those bones. Mother's house in San Francisco seemed smaller and quieter after the trip south. Adults had lost the wisdom from the surface of their faces. My brother Bailey had left home, and my room had all the cheeriness of a dungeon. I've made up my mind, Mother. I'm going to work. I know I'm only 15, but I'm a year ahead of my grade. I want to break through school to be self-sufficient and... I knew Mother wouldn't be difficult to convince... After all, she was the original do-it-yourself girl. What kind of job, Maya? Have you thought what you're most fitted for? They have women working on the streetcars as conductors now because of the war. That's what I'd like to do. I already pictured myself sailing up and down the hills of San Francisco in a dark blue uniform with a money changer at my belt. They don't accept colored people on the streetcars. Oh. My first reaction was disappointment then. That's just not fair. Indignation. I will be a conductorette. I will sling a money changer from my belt. I will. To a state of stubbornness where the mind is locked like the jaws of an enraged bulldog. Well, nothing beats a child but a failure. Give it everything you got. In the offices of the Market Street Railway Company, the receptionist seemed as surprised to see me there as I was surprised to find the interior dingy and the decor drab. I had expected waxed surfaces and carpeted floors. I might have decided against working for such a poor mouth looking concern. As it was, I said, I would like to apply for a job as a conductorette. Have you come from an agency? No. Agency staff only. I am applying for the job listed in this morning's Chronicle, and I'd like to be presented to your personnel manager. He's out for the day. She swiveled away from me in her chair. May I ask his name? She swiveled back. Whose name? Your personnel manager. The personnel manager? We were both playing out our roles in this crummy waiting room, bound to duel to the death. Oh, that's Mr. Cooper. He's out. I'm not sure you'll find him in tomorrow either, but you can try. Thank you. You're welcome. For the next three weeks... Morning. Morning. My trips to the streetcar office... Morning. Morning. ...were off the frequency of a person on a salary. Morning. Morning. And then eventually... Morning. Here. They were job application forms. To be filled in triplicate. Sitting at a side table. The standard questions required dexterous lying. My mind and I wove a cat's ladder of near truths and total lies and wrote the fable of Marguerite Johnson, aged... Uh... Nineteen? Former employer. Uh... Companion... And driver to Mrs. Annie Henderson, white lady in Stamps, Arkansas. I was given blood tests, physical coordination tests, and psychology tests. Then, on a blissful day... Step forward in the car, please. I was hired as the first Negro on the San Francisco streetcars for one whole semester... 
the streetcars and I shim it up and scoot it down the sheer hills of San Francisco. My work shifts were split so haphazardly that it was easy to believe that my superiors had chosen them maliciously. And when spring classes began, I resumed my commitment to formal education. She did not quite know for what she was weeping. She only knew that some great sense of loss, some great sense of incompleteness possessed her. The Well of Loneliness was my introduction to lesbianism and what I thought of as pornography. After my third reading of it, I became a bleeding heart for the downtrodden, misunderstood lesbians. Are you born a lesbian? Or do you become one? It was during this reflective time that I examined my own body more. What is that? Which just seemed to fuel my confusion. So when my stepfather, a very good man, Daddy Cladell, was at the club one evening, I sat down on the side of Mother's bed. Mother, I've got to talk to you. Okay. Mother, my pocketbook. Really? Do you mean your vagina? Don't use those southern terms. There's nothing wrong with the word vagina. It's a clinical term. Now... What's wrong with it? Well, have you got crabs? I don't know, Mother. Oh, you'd know if you had them. You don't have a venereal disease, do you? Why, Mother, of course not. That is a terrible question. Sit down, Riddy. Mother, something is growing on my vagina. Oh, really? Go get me the big Webster's Dictionary. Then read me what it says next to the word vulva. There's nothing to worry about, baby. It happens to every woman. It's just human nature. I'm too tall. My feet are big. And I have no hips or breasts or anything. I thought maybe I was turning into a lesbian. I made arrangements a long time ago to have a boy and a girl. The man upstairs, he don't make mistakes. He gave you to me to be my girl. And that's just what you are. Now, have a glass of milk and you go back to bed. Hmm. What I needed was a boyfriend. A boyfriend's acceptance of me would guide me into this strange, exotic land of frills and femininity. Up the hill from my house lived two handsome brothers. If I could hook one temporarily, I might be able to work the relationship into something more lasting. One evening, the brother I had chosen came walking directly into my trap. Would you like to have sexual intercourse with me? His mouth hung open like a garden gate. Take me somewhere. We went to his friend's house, who left us alone in his room. The seductee turned off the lights. I would have preferred them left on, but didn't want to appear more aggressive than I had been already, if that was possible. I had anticipated long, soulful kisses and gentle caresses... But instead, the time was spent in laborious groping, pullings, yankings, and jerkings. Not one word was spoken. Three weeks later, having thought very little of that strange and strangely empty night, I found myself pregnant. Mother was tied up tighter than Dick's hatband in the weave of her own life. She saw me grow more buxom, but didn't suspect... And when I was six months gone... Save some cereal for Daddy, Marguerite. I'm going now, darling. I'll be back before you know it. Mother left to open a nightclub in Alaska. It was quite an achievement. I mean, how many Negroes are there in Alaska? She was gone, and I felt treacherous, not telling her the news. Two months more slipped by, and I was adapting to the pregnancy, although I still didn't link it to having a baby. Two days after V-Day, and eight months pregnant, I stood with my San Francisco summer school class at Mission High School, 
and received my diploma. That evening, I left a note on Daddy Cladell's bed. Dear parents, I am sorry to bring this disgrace on the family, but I am pregnant. Marguerite. There was some confusion after that, because when I told my stepfather I was due to have the baby in three weeks, he told Mother I was three weeks pregnant. She's more than any three weeks, said Mother on her return. Who is the boy, Maya? D do you want to marry him? No. Does he want to marry you? No. Well, that's that. No use ruining three lives. And in the next two weeks, I whirled around the city, going to the doctors, taking vitamins, and buying clothes for the baby. And then, ah, 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 ah. <coughs> my son was born. I had a baby, and he was beautiful, and he was mine, totally mine. No one had bought him for me or helped me through it. I had help in the conception, but no one could deny that I had had an immaculate pregnancy. He was totally my possession, and I was afraid to touch him. He's perfect. He's so tiny, like he's unfinished. I would sit and look at him for hours. But I was so afraid of my clumsiness. M mother, will mother, will you change him? I can't keep doing this for you. I just don't want to crush him, please. It's okay. There, there. Wake up, Maya. Your baby needs you. Let him lie with you. No, no, no! Please, please! I'll, I'll roll over and crush him. Nonsense! J just lie next to him. And there he was, beautiful, laying on his back in the center of my bed, smiling at me. I edged in. Bit by bit, until we were snuggled up close. See, don't think about doing the right thing. Just do it. She turned out the light and left. I was lying on my stomach with my baby, and he was sleeping, touching my side. Sleep tight, my beautiful baby. That was I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, the first volume of Maya Angelou's extraordinary memoirs. The narrator, older Maya, was played by Ajoa Ando. I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings was dramatized by Patricia Kumper and produced and directed by Pauline Harris.